Amen. Are you glad to be here this morning? It sounded like you were glad to be here uh, this morning. It is good to be together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and to know His presence with us by the Spirit and to join our hearts and voices together in worship of the King. There's nowhere else to be this morning but here with God's people in His presence. It's good to be here. I'd ask you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 1. We will be taking a break from our studies through Luke's Gospel and... um, We're just going to take some time over the next few weeks to think seriously about what it means for God to become a human being so that he might rescue our souls from sin and death and hell itself. We need this message. Before I read and then pray and then we will reflect on one of the verses in this passage, uh, just a couple of things. Um... The children's ministry, we sent out a note uh, that we are planning for, praying for, continue to pray that logistically, in every way, we will be able to begin our children's ministries anew and afresh in January. Jenna has begun the preparations. Um, For the month of December, we are giving uh, Jenna the month off. Uh, She has been producing videos for the children that go with the material that's available on Sunday mornings as part of an, a virtual junior church program, and we are so grateful for that. Uh, indebted to her, really, she's devoted a lot of time to provide that ministry to our kids, and we're very, very grateful. And uh, she's now ramping up for in-person ministry in January, so we thought it was appropriate to give her uh, a little bit of time off. So those videos won't be happening over the next four weeks, but we will be moving Uh, Again, planning and moving towards our in-person ministry. Please pray for Jenna. Pray for us as a church family. Uh, The resources we need to make that ministry happen and to do it well. Um, We are looking to the Lord for all those things. So we would ask you to continue uh, in prayer. And thank you again, Jenna, wherever you are uh, this morning. Thank you. Also, uh, we've let you know already we are planning for a Christmas Eve service. Normally we would have one service at 6 o'clock on Christmas Eve. You'll be receiving an email in the next few days asking for uh, your uh, response. We want to, I know it's weeks away and you can't commit to anything more than like three hours in advance these days, but we need to know, we are planning tentatively to have two services because of the number of restrictions in the facility here. So we would have a service at four o'clock for up to 85, 90 people, and we would have a service at six o'clock for again, the same number. Uh, What we're going to do is send out an email and just look for your response, uh, whether you plan on attending and uh, which service time. And I will warn you in advance, that doesn't mean you get what you put down in the email. What we're trying to figure out is what are the numbers. If we only have enough people for one service, if that's all the demand is, then we will have one service at six o'clock. But if the demand goes beyond that, and we're praying that it does, uh, then we will trust God to give grace in two services. And if any of that announcement didn't make any sense, Kim will send you an email, and she will make it all clear to you. All right, let's turn our attention to God's Word. John chapter 1, I'm going to read verses 1 to 14, but we're really just reflecting on verse 5 this morning as we enter into the season of what we call Advent, uh, reflecting on and anticipating uh, the grace of God coming into our lives through the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'll read verses 1 to 14, and then we will pray together, and uh, then we'll reflect on verse number 5. So John's Gospel, chapter 1 and verse 1, listening to the word of the Lord. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing has been made. That ha- nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, 
He gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of a human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Father, we thank You and praise You again for Your scriptures for the word you have preserved for us given to us and for the light and revelation concerning your son and our the blessing for our souls as you open our eyes by the spirit and you open our hearts to receive and and we enter into the truth that is revealed in Jesus and the light that is Jesus and the life that is Jesus and through repentance and faith we come to know and rejoice in your presence with us and we father again are amazed and blessed at this great gift and the this powerful passage of your word that that portrays and explains and and gives us the framework of that gift for us. Father, you have been so good to us. Thank you for your love and grace for bringing us all to this moment. We are glad and grateful to be here. Thank you for showing us in these days through some hard things that this is not to be taken for granted. We need to redeem every moment that we can for relationship, for worship, for fellowship, for ministry. Father, we we don't know the time that we have, so give us, again, impress this lesson on us deeply and powerfully, never to take these moments for granted, but to take full advantage of these opportunities to meet together before your presence. And Father, we thank you for your continued care over us as a church family. We do recognize, uh, Father, and our larger community and in country and world, the, the, along with all of the usual challenges and difficulties, this virus continues to wreak havoc on lives and families and communities. And, Father, we feel the impact as well in many different ways. And so we pray out of a sense of great need, and even in some sense a darkness of sorts in these days, we are praying, Father, that you might pour in light in this moment and light in these days, that you might awaken our souls to the light that is ours in Jesus in every circumstance, that there is no darkness we might engage in this life that will put out the light that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask for more hope, for a greater faith and confidence in our Savior. And we ask, Father, for witness. Help us in our lives, in our faith response to these days. Help us to reflect the truth and power and beauty of Jesus. Use us to draw others to faith in Christ. We do pray for safety and and health and recovery for those who are sick. We pray for those who care for the sick, that you would watch over them and keep them safe. We pray, Father, for decision makers, that you would give them wisdom beyond their own wisdom. Give them wisdom uh, to to find the right course and to make the right decisions for, for the safety, health and safety of people. And we pray, Father, that in your mercy and grace and according to your good timing, and, and Father, it is in your hands. The end of this is in your hands. We pray for mercy. We pray for relief. And in the midst of that, Father, we have all these other things, constant, have nothing to do with COVID. Pray for Bill Sanger this morning, for our dear brother. While he's been far from us for many years and not able to attend, he and Donna, we thank you for them and their love and commitment to Jesus and their love and commitment to their church. And Father, I pray for our brother as he stands on the edge of eternity, that you would fill him with great hope and joy and expectation. And while we may not see the effects of that ministry to his heart, we pray, Father, we trust you will do this for him as you bring him home. I pray for Donna as she loves and cares for Bill. Thank you for her love and devotion and the witness that is to her family. I pray that you would strengthen her. Father, this circumstance is hard enough, but with her own cancer and cancer treatments, uh, the own, her own challenging uh, in terms of strength, I, I just pray for in every way that you would carry her through these days and help us, Father, even from a distance, however we might help and encourage, uh, just make us a tangible benefit to them in these days. And I do pray, as Bill would demand that I pray, I pray for his family that don't know and love Jesus, and there are many. I know Bill witnessed to them consistently, constantly, the truth that is the 
the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I pray that those seeds would come to life by your spirit in these days, and I pray that you would save. Father, I also ask for more grace for Trevor and Chandler and his family. I thank you for your care for him in these days, and just pray for uh, Lisa's mom, who is very sick as well. And Father, not only her physical needs, but her deep spiritual need, I pray that you would bring to her gospel voices. I pray that you would awaken in her memories of the gospel that she heard and, and that she saw in her daughter. I pray, Father, that you would give her grace and salvation. And I pray for that family that has suffered so many losses. Father, I can't even imagine. And so I pray that in these days you would bring great light and comfort and hope in Christ to this family and be with our brother. Thank you for his testimony of faith, the evidence of grace. Thank you for the way you are at work in him. Use him in their lives as well. And we just trust them into your, into your care. And Father, in praying about these, just these few things, we know there are many more things. And so I pray that you would stir in each one of us a spirit of prayer and dependency, that we would cast the things that weigh us down, the things that cause us to stumble in our following of Jesus. Give us hearts that will quickly cast our cares and burdens on you. And thank you, Father, that you care for us. And we ask your help now, Father, with our, your word open before us. Uh, we need to hear from you. We need the work of your spirit in our minds and hearts. Father, would you, again, in that miraculous way, by your spirit, just bring us into your very presence that we might see you and know you and love you more deeply and follow you more faithfully in these days. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We uh, had a, a strange, comforting, therapeutic moment in the office this week. In uh, Above Kim's desk, some of you have seen it, she's got the calendar. Not just a calendar, but the calendar, right? It's a big plastic thing with the months on it, and you can adjust it. You can reuse it every year because you write in the dates, and then she keeps all of us on track, me mostly, with what's coming, what do we need to be prepared for, what have we forgotten, and it gets all written in there. And, and as the year progresses, you almost have a, a history of the, of the year as it goes by, and it's kept there on the board. And this past week, I don't know that it was the motivation for it, but I walked into the office, and Kim was wiping away 2020. She, she, she just wiped it right out. Well, all but November and December. We still, we still have those. And uh, we, we chuckled and, and made a joke about it that that would be a nice way to approach 2020 in many respects for many of us. Is just Let's just wipe that out and we'll, we'll start over. I suspect in many ways all of our hearts are drawn to that kind of therapy. But could I suggest to you this morning that that's not what God would have us do? We can't and we shouldn't try that kind of thing in our real lives in any real way because the Father has called us, He has rescued us by His grace and He has called us to trust Him in all things and to see His hands of love and grace on every part of our lives through every circumstance of life. We have not been alone in this year past. He has not left us or forgotten us. Time and history for the world and for you personally has not gone off the rails. This may be hard. It's hard for me. But 2020 was precisely what God designed it to be. And so what do we do with it? I think what I hope to do today and over the next few weeks together that God will give us the grace to lust, love Him and trust Him and worship Him in light of 2020 as we look at our lives through the lens of His gift of grace to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. As we take advantage of what we call this Advent season and put the lens of the intrusion of God, the the incarnation of God, the coming of God into the world to rescue us from the darkness that is without, outside of us and within us, that we, we would look at life again in a new and fresh way through the lens of that gift of grace and truly worship the King. Find the comfort and the hope we need, not by forgetting what has gone on in the past, but by remembering the gifts of God's grace to us in the past. And in a real sense, that's what Advent season is all about. It's taken the word Advent from 
a Latin word which simply means coming. And I won't go into the long history of Advent and the different expressions of Advent in the life of the church and in the lives of different denominations. We use it, some would say, pretty loosely. But I think it's important for us this year to pick up this idea of thinking through the longing that was in place as God's people waited for the light to come in the past. And as we pray through our own longing, as we wait in the darkness for the light to come again. In some respects, and I don't want to sound like a Hallmark Christmas special, we need the message of Advent and Christmas in a very unique and powerful way this year. We need to understand what God has done for us and in us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this sense, again, our circumstances this year have prepared us in a unique way to reflect, to remember, to walk through the season of Advent. A quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I I got this from an article by Justin Holcomb about Advent. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, the celebration of Advent is possible only to those who who are troubled in soul, who know themselves to be poor and imperfect, and who look forward to something greater to come. Justin Holcomb goes on in his article, What is Advent?, to describe it in this way. The church today is in a similar situation to Israel at the end of the Old Testament. In exile, waiting and hoping in prayerful expectation for the coming of the Messiah. Israel looked back to God's past gracious actions on their behalf in leading them out of Egypt into the Exodus. And on this basis, they called for God once again to act for them in the same way The church during Advent looks back upon Christ's coming in celebration while at the same time looking forward in eager anticipation to the coming of Christ and his kingdom when he returns for all of his people. Oh, that God would give us the grace to to step into that heart as we, and that message, that theme, as we celebrate Advent and the coming of Christ into the world. We will remember his first coming and find lessons as we wait and long for his second coming. So what is our plan? For, for today, we're just going to think about what it means to wait in the darkness. Really just two things. The unavoidable darkness and the inextinguishable light. Those are the two themes we just want to think through today in regards to Advent. And then in the next three Sundays, we're going to pick up what I'll call the key ingredients for Christmas. And you might guess it has nothing to do with what kind of food you eat or what kind of decorations you put up. In fact, it has nothing to do with you at all. It has everything to do with God. And so over the next three weeks, we will consider the ingredients in the heart of God that make Christmas not only possible, but necessary. That is, the love of God, the power of God, and the glory of God. If any of those things are not part of God's character and nature, then Christmas, quite frankly, just never happens. There's never a rescue for sinners in the darkness of sin. But for today, look again, John 1 and verse 5, and think with me about what it means for us to wait in the dark. In verse 5, it says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. We're introduced to a theme in John here. It is his way of describing the environment, the condition of humanity, and the theme is darkness. And what we will see briefly this morning is the unavoidable darkness in this world. Before we get to the light as it's described in verse 5, I do want you just to see very quickly the context for that statement, the light shines in the darkness. And in fact, this whole passage, 1 to 14, could be unpacked and should be unpacked together. I encourage you to to make it part of your devotional life over the next few weeks. Just meditate on the sections of this powerful description of the incarnation, of the the gift of God to us in in the Lord Jesus. But notice quickly verses 1 to 4, as we make our way to the description of Jesus as the light in the darkness. John is very direct and to the point. 
in this what's called a prologue. Some have called it a foyer to the, the rest of the book. We, he here in these opening verses, 14, 18 verses, he describes for us what is coming. He makes bold statements about Jesus that will be revealed in his account of the life and ministry of Jesus. And he, with great clarity and remarkable conviction, led by the Spirit, simply declares that Jesus is God in a unique way, picking up words and themes from the Old Testament and powerfully weaving them together so that we might understand just who it is we're dealing with when we deal with the Jesus of Nazareth. He says, the Word, in the beginning was the Word, echoes there intentionally back to Genesis 1 and verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And how did that happen? He spoke, and the universe came into being. Here John says, The Word is now personified. It's made into a a tangible being. And when we think of Word, we should think of the mind and heart and will of God being expressed and communicated. And he's saying here, Jesus is the Word. Jesus is the mind, the heart, the will of God made flesh, communicated. You can't get any more clear than that. We're told that the, the Word was with God. The fellow, has fellowship with God, relationship with God, is in this sense distinguishable from God, and yet we're told next that He is God. We wade into the deep waters of the, of the Trinity, that this Word who is with God is always also God Himself. In fact, He is the agent of creation within the Godhead. Nothing exists except by the creative power of the Word which again, he's going, to on, going on to explain, is Jesus Christ himself. And in this word, who is God, and again, in relationship with God, God the Father, God the Son, there's relationship there within the Trinity, but there's only one God. The agent of creation himself is the life and the light within creation. That's what we come to in verse 4. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. And we might take at that point that John is simply making a statement about creation, about how life came into being in the universe that God created, that he is the source of life. And that's true. And I suspect John wants us to think in those terms. But very quickly, he turns our attention, not just for, uh, in terms of the, uh, away from the physical reality of life, he turns us towards the spiritual reality reality of life. And that brings us to verse 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. It's not here just the light shining in the darkness of, of eternity past when the universe came into being out of nothing. In a sense, Jesus is the light that shines in the past that brings the universe into being. He's moving us forward now, anticipating what it is he will describe, how it is he will show that Jesus is the light of the world. That light, Jesus, shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And surely at this point, darkness should jump off the page at us. Why is it that the light shines into darkness? Why is it that in John's gospel, he will choose this term, this picture, to help us understand the human condition, the condition in the world today? Well, listen to what John says later on. In John 3, verses 19, in verse 19, this is the verdict, he says, light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. The image of darkness is bound up with the idea or the reality of evil, evil acts, things that are wrong, things that people try to hide because they know they don't want them exposed. And darkness is used to cover up wickedness. John 8, verse 12, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. That is, Jesus wants us to understand that he has come as spiritual light so that we might not have to walk in the darkness, which is our reality, without him in this broken world. And he says again in John 12, verse 46, I have come into the world, Jesus says, as light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Clearly, it's important for us to think about what it is John means and Jesus means when he talks about darkness, this unavoidable darkness that is part of the human experience, condition. 
Darkness is the image used to help us understand the human condition and the global environment in which we live. It is because sin and rebellion against God plunges humanity, because it separates us from God, it plunges us into darkness. The imagery in those opening verses is life and light are bound up with God and the Word, God the Son, who has displayed that light in life. We need to be in relationship with Him if we're going to have life and if we're going to have light. And those are powerfully overlapping uh, qualities. The, the gardeners, the farmers in the room will understand the importance of light for life, right? You can't grow things without the proper light. And those, again, those images are meant to powerfully overlap for us that we have life and light only as we walk in relationship, right relationship with God. But that's not the case. John says, the world is full of darkness. Sin and rebellion against God plunges humanity into darkness. Let me give you a couple of passages from the Old Testament. Uh, Just, again, it isn't to discourage anyone. It is to give us a proper understanding of, not just of the darkness, why it's there and where it comes from and how it manifests itself in our lives and in the world around us, but the darkness explains why it is we need Jesus. You can't understand why God would become a human being and die on a cross for the removal of our sin unless we understand what that problem of darkness really is. In Genesis 6, verse 5, as God stands on the edge of a global judgment against human beings, saving only Noah and his family in the flood, this is God's assessment of the human condition. So the trajectory, Adam and Eve sin in the garden, what is the trajectory for humanity? Where will it go? Will it, will it make its way back into fellowship with God, having been cast out because of their sin, the darkness of their sin, cast out from the light of God's presence in the garden? Will they make their way back to God? This is God's description of the trajectory of the human race generations after Adam and Eve first sinned. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become in the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. That's not a good sign, is it? That in whatever number of years those years are, it is not a long period of time for human beings. In fact, we could look at Cain and Abel, that story right in Genesis chapter 4, where the first siblings, well, one kills the other. The trajectory... The human race is on because of sin is towards darkness and away from the light that only God can provide. In fact, God in His mercy sets out salvation plan for us. And the plan begins to unfold in the Old Testament Scriptures and it unfolds through His love and His work through the nation of Israel. And He reveals Himself to them. He gives them light and revelation. He gives them life. And He gives to them instruction so that they might know him and know the light of his presence with them as a community. How does that go? Let me jump ahead of the, in the history of Israel in the Old Testament to 2 Chronicles 36, verses 11 to 16. This is the last king of Judah before they go into exile. Here's the description of the, the human condition of the Israelites who were the beneficiaries of God's gracious revelation in the Old Testament. Zedekiah, he was the king, he was 21 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 11 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord his God and he did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet who spoke the word of the Lord. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar who had made, uh, made him take an oath in God's name. He became stiff-necked and hardened his heart and would not turn to the Lord, of the God of Israel. Furthermore, all the leaders of the priests and the people became more and more unfaithful, following all of the detestable practices of the nations and defiling the temple of the Lord, which he had cons- consecrated in Jerusalem. The Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word to them through his messengers, the prophets, again and again, because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked God's messengers, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people. And then there are some of the most frightening words in all of the Old Testament scriptures. There was no remedy. Having been said on a trajectory deeper into the darkness because of sinful hearts, we see that even with God's communication and intervention through the prophets, there is no remedy, there is no hope for the people, even the people of Israel, let alone the surrounding nations, because of the darkness within their own hearts. And 
simply put, to again jump ahead by light speed, light years, it is unchanged today, this problem of darkness. The trajectory set by Adam and Eve continues. And it leads further and further from God and further and further into the darkness. The more an individual or a community or a people, a nation, the more, in a global sense, humanity pursues life without God, it only deepens the darkness within them and around them. It is not a remedy to try and save oneself or find one's escape out of the darkness in, apart from the presence and power, the gracious intervention of Almighty God. It leads only further into the darkness. That's the image, very briefly, that you and I should have in our minds and hearts when we read in John 1 verse 5, the light shines in the darkness. And there are vital lessons here for us from Scripture, bound up with the heart of these celebrations of the grace of God coming in the Lord Jesus. Do you realize this morning, and let me speak directly to you if you're not a Christian, there is only darkness, spiritual and otherwise, if we seek to live without God in the world. There's only darkness. And please don't be fooled. The battery-operated night lights that this world wants to offer you are much like the night lights in my house. None of them seem to work for very long. There's no, there, there's no solution to be found in the darkness out there, and there's no solution to be found within your own heart. The solution, and I'll expand on this more in a moment, the solution is found in the light that is Jesus Christ himself the light that brings us spiritual life because he is the one who in his living was willing to die. A perfect life given in sacrifice so that our sin, our rebellion, all that God held against us in our spiritual darkness so that that would be forgiven and we would be set free. Freed from the darkness and brought into the light and our only hope is to run to him, not away from him this morning. I pray that you will. And if you have questions about that, I'd be delighted to talk with you more afterwards. There is only darkness if you continue to seek to live life without God in the world. But there's another lesson here. And we must be careful to see it. Spiritual darkness, as John describes it here, and I've quickly surveyed in Scripture, spiritual darkness is not only something we experience environmentally, that is, we are born into a dark world spiritually, It is the reality we're born with sinful parents and sinful family members and a sinful community. The the darkness is all around us and we're born into that. But that's not all that the darkness is. The spiritual darkness around us is something that we all contribute to. In my thoughts, in my words, in my actions, that's really, I need to be rescued from that. Not just from the fact that God might condemn me, because of those things, but because those things actually contribute to the the spiritual darkness that is around me, has an adverse effect, not just on my own soul, but on the souls of those around me. And there is caution here for you and I, if you know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, am I walking in the light of the gospel, the truth, the revelation that is Jesus Christ, and the life that He He calls us to and pulls us into. Is my life a spiritual blessing, a spiritual light to others? Or to what degree is there a need for humility and repentance because my thoughts, my relationships, my activities maybe are contributing more to darkness than they are to light? Yes, the light I just want, or the darkness I want you to see is unavoidable. That's the reality of the human condition that John is speaking to in this gospel account and in this verse but I want you to see his emphasis isn't for us to sit in the dark it's to see the light isn't it and so we see again the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it the light shines in the darkness in a sense in the Old Testament scriptures God displays this in his communication with Israel and through Israel to the nations That though it's dark, though their trajectory in sin is away from God into further spiritual darkness, God continues to bring the light. He continues to communicate light. He continues to communicate a promise of light. 
And so we're reminded, as Josh read earlier from Isaiah chapter 9, in the context of spiritual darkness for the people of Israel and the looming judgment of God against their souls, this is the message of God. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And on those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. And then in verse 6, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He goes on to describe how his government, his rule in and over the lives of his people will never end. It will go on forever. God promises in the Old Testament that light is coming. John in John 1 and verse 5 and really at the beginning here in verses 1 to 18, he's declaring, he's, he's announcing the light has arrived and his name is Jesus. Yes, the darkness is deep and unavoidable, but the light cannot be extinguished. In fact, if you jump into verse 9, where John begins to expand on this, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And then in verse 14, the Word became flesh. We take those expressions up together in the passage and we understand that he's talking about the arrival of the Lord Jesus Christ, His birth, His coming into the world, invading time and history so that He might rescue human beings out of the darkness. That we, own, that, that we know in time and in history. This is the moment, this is the event that the faithful remnant in the Old Testament Scriptures were looking for and longing for and waiting for in the darkness. People like Zechariah and Simeon. In fact, turn over to Luke, those early chapters again. And as in other years, we will bounce in and out of Luke 1 and 2, wherever else we are, because he gives such a detailed account of the the birth, the incarnation, the miracle of Jesus coming into the world. I want you to see simply that against the backdrop of the spiritual darkness in their day, there was this remnant kept by God that looked and longed for the light, even as they waited in the darkness. And how beautiful, how magnificent is the emergence of light out of that darkness. It is life-transforming. And so Zechariah... We won't go into his whole story. He, uh, he stumbles in his faith response to the angel when he's told John the Baptist will be his son. But in the end, he expresses great faith in his song. So in chapter 1 and verse 68, this is what he sings to the Lord in worship at the birth of his son, John the Baptist. Praise be to the, the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. Now take that verse Stand that verse against the the passage in Isaiah 9 and other Old Testament passages where God says someone is coming and that someone is going to be Emmanuel, God Himself. And here, Zechariah, singing better than he truly knows, says that moment has come. God has come to redeem us and to rescue His people. Jump down into verse 76. His heart is exploding with the light of the truth that the Messiah is coming. It has arrived. And you, my child, he's speaking of John now, John the Baptist, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare the way for him. And this is what he will do, that is the Messiah, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadows, shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. Zechariah is pretty excited at this point in time out of the spiritual darkness of his day when his people are in bondage to a pagan empire that will uh, only do harm to the Jewish people who want to faithfully follow uh, the Lord. In the darkness of many around him, Jewish people around him, abandoning faithfulness to the Lord. In the darkness of years and years Waiting and waiting and waiting, generation after generation. Now he's been told, and is actually brought into the drama of it all by being the father of John the Baptist, he's told the light has arrived. And it changes everything. 
Look at old Simeon 2 in chapter 2 and John chapter 2. Again, Jesus has come. He's, the parents are bringing the baby to the temple to do um, the appropriate Old Testament uh, ceremonial activity regarding the birth of this new boy. And there at the temp- temple, we're told, is a man named Simeon, who in verse 25 of chapter 2 is righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. So th- here's an individual who is an old man who has been waiting his entire life and was reflecting back on all of the generations since God had promised w- in, in centuries before of a coming light, of a coming Messiah, of a coming rescue, he's been waiting and waiting and waiting, trusting, believing. And listen to the song he sings as he holds the Messiah in his hands. Verse 29, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. I'm ready to die. For my eyes have seen your salvation. Isn't that beautiful? And he's literally holding the King of glory, the eternal Son of God, in his hands as a baby boy. And he can't fully understand all that is happening in that moment. He can't put all of the pieces together, how this could be. But he knows, here is the salvation that I've longed for. Here is the light that I've longed for. In fact, he goes on to say, My eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. The light has come. And Simeon says, you can take me out now. I see your plan fulfilled in the birth of this child. We, I struggle, I suspect we all struggle, to really get into the deep end of what it means when we say the Word became flesh. The eternal light was coming into the world that Jesus is God the Son. He's both God and man. That is what we worship around and in this time of year and every time of year, but in a unique way as we anticipate the light that we long for in our own spiritual darkness. This is the miracle at the center of it all. And I wonder if we, wonder if we at times give up trying to get to the deep water. I would encourage you, we need to spend some time in these passages of Scripture so that we might be challenged and have our minds and hearts expanded for what this means. Our souls in the darkness deserve nothing good from God, and yet God was pleased to send His Son, the light of the world, so that we might be rescued from the darkness. Having been rescued, and this is where the lessons for us today, for believers today, I think we begin to think this through. Having been rescued, we must learn to live as light in the darkness. What did Jesus say in Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount to those who would follow Him, who would embrace Him as Messiah, follow Him as King, enter His kingdom? Christians, what did He say? You are the what? You are the light of the world. Having been rescued from the darkness and awakened by the light, and having the light of Christ dwell within us by faith, the light of who He is and what He has done for us through His death and resurrection, and the light of His presence by the Spirit, having now possession of the light, we are the light to a lost world, to the same dark world that Jesus entered. Having been rescued, we must learn to live as light in the darkness, because you and I must still live in the environment of darkness. And that can be discouraging. That's where we began, really, when we think not just about the darkness that manifests itself in the death of our loved ones, though many of us have experienced that in this past year, not only the darkness that comes with physical challenges like viruses or relational challenges and discord or financial challenges, however they might arise, all of those are symptomatic of the reality we live in a dark world, all of those are part of the darkness we live in. But that's not the darkness we've been talking about this morning, is it? The darkness we're talking about is the darkness that exists because of the condition of the human heart and the thoughts and the words and the activities of people. And we're called to walk as light shoulder to shoulder with people who are in that darkness. That Jesus has left us here and called us to shine out the the light, the truth of the gospel in this dark world. Which means at the very least, when it gets difficult for whatever reason, 
whining and complaining are not an appropriate response for the people of God. But the example of the Savior, the light who came into our darkness, is the example we follow, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross. And so we set him out as our example and we are determined in these days as his people that we will follow Jesus in the light in these dark days. Will we do that? Will we do that? Not that that will be easy and we will need much grace from God, but we will walk. I don't mean that we won't suffer hardship. I mean we will walk in righteousness. We will seek to think and to speak and to to do the things that reflect the holiness of the one who has rescued us from the darkness. We will walk differently from the darkness around us and from those who, whose trajectory continues to take them further into that spiritual darkness. And so we will, by God's grace, as we follow his example, we will wait well in the darkness until he returns. Let me wrap up these thoughts uh, just with a bit of a challenge for my heart and for yours. This verse These truths demand careful reflection and thought on my part, on your part, and careful application to our lives, to our waiting in the darkness, to our living as light in the darkness today. Can I suggest a couple of things? We need to look to the revelation of the light in Scripture if we are going to live as light in the darkness. We need to be immersed in the the light that is Scripture itself. We need to We need to spend time in these passages of Scripture if we're going to know what it means to live as light in the darkness and have the strength to do it. We need to confess regularly our need of that light, that there's still darkness that He needs to overcome in us, sin that He needs to overcome. Humbly acknowledge our need of Jesus to repent of our sin and to walk, commit ourselves again to walk in the light. Confession and repentance must be a necessary part of our Advent celebrations and our pursuit of living as light in the dark world that we live in. And we must share the light with those in the darkness. What I mean is, we must so long for the light to impact the lives of people around us, we won't just talk about communicating the light, the truth of the gospel, the truth about Jesus to people. We will actually do that. And that is a challenge for my own heart. Because I preach about that kind of stuff all the time. The question is, Clemens, are you going to get up tomorrow morning? Are you going to find someone? Are you going to get next to someone? Pray for someone that you can share the light with. The nature of the light, from its first arrival in Jesus to its expression in every believer, is to shine outward and penetrate the darkness. Our waiting should be bound up with witness, longing to see the light impact the lives of many around us. And one other thing that we have stressed many times in many different ways in these days. We, in these days of spiritual darkness, we should look for and long for the light to return again. Do not look for and long for a restoration of life as it used to be in North America before COVID or before whatever. We look and long for the return of King Jesus. Because when we see Him the darkness will be destroyed forever. That's the message of Advent to our hearts every year. Just in in a word of prayer, boring words from the Gettys. O Savior of our fallen race, O brightness of the Father's face, O Son who shared the Father's might before the world knew day or night, O Jesus, very light of light, our constant star in sin's deep night, now hear the prayers your people pray throughout this world this holy day. Remind us, Lord, of life and grace, how once to save our fallen race you put our human vesture on and came to us as Mary's son. Today, as year by year its light brings to our world a promise bright, One precious truth outshines the sun. Salvation comes through you alone. For from the Father's throne you came, his banished children to reclaim, and earth and sea and sky revere the love of him who sent you here. And we are jubilant today, for you have washed our guilt away. 
Oh, hear the glad new song we sing on this, the birth of Christ our King. O Savior of our fallen race, the world will see your radiant face. For you who came to us before will come again and will all restore. Let songs of praise your name adorn, O Christ, Redeemer, Virgin born, whom with the Father we adore, and Holy Spirit evermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.